I beat Baldur's Gate 3 in honor mode by casting True Strike over 2,000 times. In this run, I didn't use explosives. There were no necrotic corpse shenanigans. I didn't attack my enemies or use weapon special abilities that deal damage. And no offensive spells of any kind other than the all-powerful, unstoppable, uh, tr True Strike. I also didn't end the game prematurely by having Gale blow himself. Uh, hold on, sorry, wrong clip. Um, here's the right one. I didn't end the game prematurely by having Gale blow himself up. I created a Dark Urge Deep Gnome Fighter and changed his name to the Darkest Urge because beating this game in a truly absurd way really is my Darkest Urge. And if you read what True Strike does, you'll begin to see why this is an absurd challenge. This ability doesn't deal damage, at least not yet. On the Nautiloid ship, I just ran past everything because I don't have a way to deal damage yet until I found myself waking up on the beach and recruited Shadowheart and we're gonna just avoid combat entirely while we power level to four by using Disguise Self. I've used this method in some of my other videos and gone into a little bit more detail on how it works, but basically all you need to know is that talking my way out of combat still gives me experience for defeating those enemies. So I just changed my form to get access to dialogue options from other races and I'm able to talk my way through encounters without even needing an ability check. And just like that, I'm level four. There's only a few important things that happened on the way to level four. The first is that I allowed Priestess Gut to brand the Darkest Urge as well as slap a brand on Verana Sunblossom, a hireling I'll be using for most of the playthrough. Throughout the video, I'll be collecting items Verana needs to help me excessively exploit some roadblocks later in the playthrough. And I'm pretty confident I can guarantee you've never seen this exploit before because I invented it myself and it's so ridiculous and tedious that I just can't imagine anybody else has come across it. For now though, Verana is going to serve as my super mobile pickpocket. I went and stole Crusher's ring while I kissed his foot because it gives me plus 10 movement speed for Verana. The next important thing that happened is I went to the Wizard's Tower in the Underdark to complete Omalum's quest, because he won't sell me the item I need until I complete this quest. There's no combat required for this, just some sneaking around, avoiding the arcane turrets line of sight so they don't blast me, and I collected everything I needed and headed back to Omalum. Now I'm able to buy an item that will turn True Strike from useless into a truly devastating force that will rip my enemies asunder! Okay, maybe not quite, but it does make it so every time I cast True Strike, it adds two stacks of reverberating to my enemy, and once they get five stacks, they'll take between one and four thunder damage. True Strike has been weaponized, if only just barely, but it can technically deal damage with enough casts now. And that brings me to the first combat of the run, and we're taking on Grim. Now, Grim is one of the few free wins that we get in this video because of the giant forge hammer we can smash him with by simply luring him to the center and pulling this lever. But just to check that the build is working, I dealt a little damage to him first by using True Strike over and over again before smashing him to bits. I crafted two sets of adamantine heavy armor at the forge, which decreases all damage taken by two. This will help me keep my darkest urge alive in the many challenging fights to come. And my second fight it unfortunately does not have any freebies and I need to kill this Dwergar with nothing but True Strike. So go ahead and hang out while I spend the next, I don't know, 50, 75, 100 rounds casting True Strike on Sergeant Thrin. Okay, so next round, Sergeant Thrin is going to take damage from Reverberation because we have it stacked up to four, so it'll go down to three on his turn. Um, but we put two every time we cast True Strike, so that'll bring it up to five. As long as he takes two damage out of a, a possible between one and four, then he's gonna die. Just please do two damage, because this is aggravating. This is absolutely awful. Okay, <laughs> we've done it. It's over. We killed him. We can loot. So the reason why I needed to kill Sergeant Thrin in just the most painful way ever is so that I can get the Ring of Absolute Force, which increases all thunder damage I deal by one. Just one, but it's going to be so worth it. With the Ring of Absolute Force, I now deal between two and five damage by stacking Reverberation instead of one to four damage. And this is actually a massive damage increase for me because the sheer number of times I'll be dealing thunder damage this game is absolutely ridiculous. This is also the reason why I needed my character to be branded by Priestess Gut so that I could have this item actually work. 
My next objective is to get the Ring of Protection from Mole, and I know there's other ways to do this without all the tieflings getting slaughtered, but given how long combat takes to finish, I am desperate to do this the easiest way possible. So I talked Kaga out of killing Arabella, then went to chat with Mole about it. She told me to steal the Idol of Sylvanas, so I put the game in turn-based mode and stole it. Before letting anything progress, I talked to Mole, got my quest reward before leaving the grove forever. I'm sure there was a massive battle that took Took place, but I want no part of it, so I headed straight for the mountain pass. I need to significantly improve my build if I want to clear the game before losing my sanity, and the Githyanki Kresh has a ton of items that I'll need. The first item is on the roof of the Kresh, the Holy Lance Helm. This helmet tries to deal radiant damage to any enemy that misses an attack against me. If they fail a dexterity saving throw after missing an attack, they'll take between 1 and 4 radiant damage. More importantly, this counts as applying a condition whether they hit me or not, so it'll always give them 2 stacks of reverberation when they try to attack. I also grabbed the Gloves of Belligerent Skies, which add 2 stacks of reverberation when I deal radiant damage with my Holy Lance Helm. So now I have the ability to apply reverberation to enemies much faster as long as I have enough armor class to avoid getting hit. Before my next major fight, I did some pickpocketing, which is basically risk-free for Verana. I can split stacks of gold in the merchant's inventory to make them easier to steal, and even if I get caught, I can just walk into the other room and stealth until everybody calms down and get right back to pickpocketing. Verana has enough movement speed and bonus actions to get very far away and hide after getting caught, so it really doesn't matter who I steal from, there's essentially zero risk. So for the rest of the video, you should just assume I've stolen all the money I'm using to buy items. With all these improvements to my build, I can do some serious damage to my enemies. Kind of. Not really, but I can technically kill them eventually. And my next opponent is the Inquisitor of the Gith Yankee Crash. And I'm not picking this fight just for the fun of it. I need the loot that the Inquisitor drops, so this is a mandatory fight that I need to win. Which makes right now the perfect time to explain how I'm going to make my character unkillable enough to survive the long combat ahead of me. I discovered that in Abjuration Wizard stacks of Arcane War, are completely busted. Arcane Ward decreases damage taken by the number of stacks you have. So it's extremely difficult to damage my character while I have stacks. Anytime the ward is depleted, I can just cast True Strike and it gives me as many stacks as I have wizard levels. It also happens if I take off and put on my armor. This is completely broken and obviously a completely intended game mechanic that I'm going to take full advantage of to make my character nearly unkillable. Without Arcane Ward, I really doubt I would be able to survive the hundreds of rounds in combat necessary to kill powerful enemies with True Strike. So, Here's my full battle plan. The first line of defense is Warding Bond cast by Shadowheart. This spell gives me resistance to all damage, which cuts the damage in half. A 10 damage hit will only be hitting me for five. That five is reduced by two because of my adamantine splint armor, and then reduced by the number of arcane ward stacks that I have. So if I have three arcane ward stacks, I literally take zero damage from a 10 damage hit. All you need to know is if I'm getting hit for 10 damage, I'm basically getting hit for zero. Now if something bigger comes in, I might take a couple points of damage, but I'm using my bonus action every turn to eat a good berry and I heal for four because I have the Periapt of Wound Closure equipped and that maxes out my healing from any source. I'm also immune to critical strikes because of my chest armor and my armor class is 26, making it so that the majority of enemies only have a 5% chance to hit me at all, let alone actually deal damage to me. Before the fight, I also picked up Bliss Spores from the Mycadid Colony because that will increase my saving throws by 1d6 against spells, and the Dream Visitor gave me Permanent Bless, giving me another 1d4 against spells. As a deep gnome, I have advantage against Intelligence, Wisdom, and Charisma saving throws, so spells have a super low chance of damaging me as well. Let's go fight the boss and see how it goes. Oh my god. 
gosh, these swords that he summons. Every single time I use True Strike on somebody, it's more and more swords, and they just kept breaking my arcane ward. And then I didn't have any damage mitigation, and now I'm dead. Now I'm dead, and it's honor mode, so I can't get Bliss Spores back. I can't get Bless back. Next time I try this, my saving throws are going to be even worse. I don't know what I'm gonna do. This is bad. Fortunately for me, this battle isn't like the end of Act 2 or Act 3, where you can't visit Withers and have him save the day, but it did shake my confidence a bit, and I had Withers revive my character and decided to wipe out the entire Githyanki crash to level up before taking another run at the Inquisitor with a new strategy. The new strategy is that I'm going to use Arcane Lock to lock the door after luring just a couple of soldiers out, and I gave myself the Resilient feat for Intelligence so that my saving throws would be close to what I was getting before. I scuffed the first approach, I tried to lure two of them out, but they saw me before they came outside, and then they ran back in, and it was just a mess. So I turned myself invisible, disengaged the combat, and while I was invisible, cast Minor Illusion again to lure them out by themselves so I could shut the door, lock it, and start working on just these two without needing to get absolutely slaughtered by everybody. Now the Inquisitor is the worst and he is still able to summon these stupid mind claws outside of the door with no line of sight, but eventually I got far enough away that he wasn't able to summon them anymore, so it does have a range. I kept getting further and further away from the door because it's gonna open at some point and they're gonna be chasing me. So I just kept working as far away as I could while casting True Strike as often as I could uh, while it wasn't making mind claws everywhere. And finally I managed to kill one of the soldiers and this was really all I needed. I just needed one enemy dead and the knowledge of stop casting True Strike for now so that I don't summon too many Mind Claws and they overwhelm me. I was taking my armor off and putting it back on in order to get my Arcane Ward to come back, and most of the damage I was dealing was just by letting them attack me and having my Holy Lance Helm do Radiant damage, which adds Reverberation stacks, which eventually does Thunder damage. And finally, after 47 rounds of combat, I took the Inquisitor down without using really any abilities at all. I didn't even have to use True Strike for this fight. Although that's not true. I did need True Strike in order to speed up the kill on the first soldier, and this archer just wouldn't shoot at me. Uh, something about having Arcane Ward makes the AI just decide not to try and, like, they don't even bother attacking you. They just know they can't do damage, so they don't even try. So I just had to cast True Strike over and over again until round 59 before I finally got this frog killed. I got the loot that I needed, and we are going to be headed to Act 2. I decided to just walk straight over to where Karnas is and just immediately challenge him to a fight because I have the I have all the kinks worked out for this build now, and I pretty much don't take damage from enemies unless they are very impressive, and Karnas is not impressive enough. He really can't hurt me, neither can any of the goblins that he's with. So after 75 rounds of combat, I finally took Karnas down, which means that I get to take his Moon Lantern, free Dolly, and we are now completely safe from the Shadow Curse. And honestly, Act 2 was pretty tame until the end. I was planning to fight Balthazar at his full strength in Shadowfell, but I wanted him to help me gain experience by letting him kill Shars just this year's for me, and it turns out he doesn't win that fight, even if I tank some hits for him. Kinda disappointing, but I'm quite confident he couldn't have killed me anyway, so it's fine. After Balthazar, I headed back to Moonrise Towers to help Minthara because she is in a bit of a bind, <laughs> about to get ripped to pieces by the Absolute. I did recruit her for a specific reason that I am going to end up forgetting to use, um, but that's okay. She was cool to have in the party anyways. The guards started running to go get help, but thankfully they didn't quite get out the doorway, so I arcane locked it, and they actually came back in, thankfully, and I let Minthara pretty much finish them off from there. I recruited Minthara to the party, and I respect her as a bard. I mean, she's already got that spider lyre, she might as well learn how to play it, right? With Minthara as a bard, I had my rogue, Verana, go and just talk your gear to death, followed by all three of the Thorms, and I just did this to gain quick and easy experience, because any actual combat takes so long. It takes such an incredibly long time to kill things with true strikes, so I'm trying to just pick fights 
fights when necessary. The fight just inside the door of Moonrise Towers can actually be pretty difficult, and more concerning for this run is that there's a lot of enemies, so it can take a long time for them to take their turns. I really wanted to keep as many Harpers alive as possible so they could do lots of damage, so I thought, okay, I'll use Arcane Lock on the door and keep the Harpers locked out, and maybe I can thin out some of the more powerful spells and attacks uh, before the Harpers get in here. What actually ended up happening is somehow they phased through the door during the cutscene, except for this poor sap who was stuck inside it, desperately trying to open it during every single one of his turns, while I'm sure he listened to the dying screams of his comrades. Because the Harpers got slaughtered almost immediately, leaving me behind to deal with the rest of the fight, and there's just nothing here that can do much damage to me. But Zrel has a shield that I need, so she's on my kill list. It only took 52 combat rounds to kill Zrel, but they were an aggravating 52 rounds. Waiting for every enemy to take their turn was about a full minute each time. So I basically spent 52 minutes casting True Strike and eating a good berry before hitting Spacebar to end my turn. It's finally time to take on the only enemy that scares me in Act 2, Kethric Thorm. We have to fight this guy three times, and the rooftop battle is going to be particularly scary and challenging, just not for the reason you'd think. This guy summons a new Necromite every single turn, and I don't think there's a cap on how many there can be, which means if he doesn't die fast, I'm going to end up with Necromites everywhere, and the combat rounds are gonna take so long, I can't, I just can't have that. The, the Necromites don't even attack me either. If I have more than one Arcane Ward stack, they just decide that, oh, well, we can't hurt him anyway, so why bother? So I just have to watch them skip turn over and over. It's awful, it's really awful. So that's why I did my best to keep Aelin alive for a little while in this fight, so she could at least land a few big hits on Ketherick before going down. In the end, Kethric killed himself because he took damage from his own exploding, hatching necromite thing. And there were only 17 necromites by the time that he died, which wasn't too bad. It definitely could have been a lot worse if Aelin had missed more of her attacks. The true boss battle of Act 2 is against the Apostle of Merkel, and in honor mode, it's a stressful encounter because if I don't have everything I need to win this fight before going down into the Mind Flayer colony, I'm screwed. There's no way to get back out, I can't have Withers revive my character if I mess up, it would just be over. Phase 1 of the fight is just Kethric again, and the only different thing is he has a Mind Flayer with him, so I held off on freeing Aelin and getting her into the fight until the Mind Flayer has been mauled to death by True Strike, because the Mind Flayer can cast Dominate Mind on her, and she does not seem good at resisting it. But now there's nothing stopping Aelin from dealing damage to Kethric, and she did pretty good damage before going down, but the rest was up to me. It took until combat round 29 to kill Kethric, and he honestly did a lot of the damage himself by summoning his little necromite pods right where he was standing, but this whole fight is really just foreplay for the main event, the Apostle of Merkel. This thing has 360 health, attacks multiple times a turn with big damage, and even prevents healing if you stand too close in the upper ring. Thankfully, I don't need to go up there at all for this battle, so I can just keep munching on good berries and potions down here. I took off my Boots of Stormy Clamor and put on the Vital Conduit Boots, which give me 8 temporary health every time I cast a concentration spell, like, oh, I don't know, maybe True Strike. I also took off my Holy Lance Helm and put on the item I looted from the Githyanki Inquisitor. The Circlet of Psionic Revenge deals psychic damage to Merkel every time I succeed seed on a saving throw against his spells. And he's going to cast two spells on me every single turn. Gaze of the Dead and Call of the Damned. This means that I can deal as much as 8 damage per turn while also gaining 8 temporary health every turn. And this is truly the entire battle strategy. 
I just need to outlast Merkel. My character is built to have high strength saving throws and constitution saving throws, which is exactly what I need to resist Gaze of the Dead and Call of the Damned. I drank a potion of Colossus to give me advantage on the strength saving throws against Call of the Damned, and uh, for Gaze of the Dead, I just am hoping that I resist as many of them as possible. Because Call of the Damned pulls everything in towards Merkel, he's constantly killing the Necromites for me, which keeps this fight from getting out of hand. And while he is sometimes able to deal damage to me, Merkel is rarely able to get through my temporary health and healing potions. I was supposed to have good berries for this, but they all disappeared when Kree died, unfortunately. There's a problem though. After dealing about 100 damage, Merkel starts absorbing Necromites and heals for a massive amount, far more healing than I could hope to outdamage. It also gives him the ability to cast Finger of Death, which in theory would have been a bit scary, but for some reason he never actually ended up casting it. I don't really know if it was a line of sight thing or if it was something else, but he just never used it, not even once. But it's a pretty serious issue that he has now healed back to full health. It's been 75 combat rounds and Merkel is at literally full health, 360 out of 360. If this keeps up, I will never be able to kill Merkel, and eventually I will run out of health potions and die. But for some reason, Merkel stops spawning Necromites. I don't know why, but he just stops. And without any Necromites on the field, he can't heal anymore, so it's just a one-on-one -on -one fight now. Since Shadowheart is taking damage from Warding Bond occasionally, I actually ended up needing to juggle my Boots of Vital Conduit between the Darkest Urge and Shadowheart because she was taking a lot of damage. So I would send it over to her when I had had all of my temporary health full and let her cast something, guidance, and get some temporary health before sending it back and re-equipping them. But I've literally got Merkel right where I want him, in a one-on-one, -on -one, and eventually, after 189 rounds of combat, I was finally at the end. Okay. He is so close to dead. He could die on any spell cast right now if I if I roll four damage out of four. Um, and I'm not anywhere near dying, but I'm gonna just drink a massive healing potion so that it's for sure locked in. But he could die. Nope, I didn't save against that one. Okay, oh my gosh, okay, he took three. He's at literally one health. He's at one health and all I need to do is just, I just need to succeed on any saving throw against his spells and he's gonna die. Nope, not that one, come on. Just die, just die, it's time. It's time, it's time, yes, yes. Oh my gosh, he's finally dead. The psychic damage was too much, his brain couldn't handle it. Getting to act three from here was easy. There's only one fight that I need to win and the Emperor does most of the work for me. I just gave him a few buffs and I hid behind the protection of the Sanctuary spell while he zapped and devoured the Githyanki attackers. Let's talk about act three because this is where all the most powerful enemies are. The only mandatory kill is Orin, because I'm going to ally with Gortash. I thought about fighting Gortash, but I've never fought him in honor mode, and I looked the fight up and saw that he might get thunder immunity, plus he has really high dexterity saving throws, so I might be able to kill him, but it doesn't seem worth the risk, and honestly, I'm pretty skeptical about whether or not I could I could kill him, especially if he gets thunder immunity. Since I'm playing as the Dark Urge, I get to duel Orin in a one-on-one -on -one fight, and she's definitely going to be powerful enough in her Slayer form to deal damage to me, even through all of my mitigation. So I want to be as prepared as possible going into it. Since I'm skipping Gortash, it seemed like it was only fair that I add something back in. So I'm going to kill Viconia in the House of Grief, and I did a community poll to ask if I should take on Raphael in the House of Hope, and the answer was an overwhelming yes. So, here's the order of fights. First, the House of Grief. After that, we'll take on the House of Hope, followed by Orin, and finally, the Netherbrain. With that in mind, I'm going to run through some of the items I picked up before the fighting begins. I went to the circus to get Nyrulna, the legendary trident. This is going straight to Varana. Then I killed an annoying elephant with True Strike, and it was, it was actually a little bit tragic. Um, she cycles through a couple of dialogue options as you damage her and it gets increasingly sad and desperate before she starts the loop over. Uh, citizen, stop this at once! No! What? Please stop! Try me without this 
chains on, coward. Devella, I'm sorry. It took me 72 combat rounds to kill Valyria, and I did feel bad and guilty by the end. But this was a necessary kill, like absolutely necessary, because I need to access the Unholy Assassin Merchant to buy the Ballist Armor for Verana. It was so expensive that I had to sell all of this. But it's a necessary item, so it's worth it. I also grabbed this fancy hat for Verana that didn't end up mattering at all, but she does look good in it, so that's something. With that, let's go take on Viconia in the House of Grief. This fight started off a little scary. Viconia was using Blight on me every turn and was definitely breaking through my damage mitigation. Plus, I was getting bone chilled, which prevents me from healing. However, the scary part was over pretty quickly because Viconia ran out of high level spell slots and I just continued running away from all of the enemies in the room until I had gotten them to use every single spell slot they had. Once all the spell slots were done, I just plopped down in the middle of the room and let my enemies start killing themselves trying to attack me. That was really easy. Viconia died on combat round 63, and I finished the fight on combat round 111. I also got to see this visual bug after, which I thought was amusing, so I thought I'd throw it in. Now I'm headed to the House of Hope, where I had hoped wouldn't be the end of this run. But Raphael was too powerful. The soul pillars aren't targetable by true strike, and Raphael heals way too much for me to be able to kill him with this build. Not to mention, he is able to get a massive amount of damage through all of my mitigation. Dude hits like a truck. His minions actually attacked one of the pillars a little bit out of frustration, but I just couldn't get them to consistently target the pillars. True Strike alone can't do it, but the good news is that something else can. Movement speed. Hell, hell. Hell has its laws. Hell. 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 Effect in the cause. Cut and force. Withhold your applause. For now, down here come the claws.
Well, that was easy. Next up is Orin, and she is a real nasty slayer monster during the fight, but the House of Hope prepared me perfectly for this battle. I equipped Raphael's armor to get more AC and damage mitigation, as well as to light Orin on fire anytime I succeed a saving throw against whatever she sends my way. I drank an elixir of Cloud Giant Strength to boost my strength to 27, so my saving throws are really good, and I equipped the Amulet of Greater Health to boost my constitution to 23 and give me advantage on my constitution saving throws. That pretty much handles everything that I need for the battle, and I can just cast True Strike on Ore in every single round until I win. Was it frustrating that I didn't tell you how I killed Raphael? I hope you'll forgive me, it's just that I really wanted the exploit reveal to be against the nether brain. that's how I always envisioned this video, and then I had to go and make a community poll and ask if I should do Raphael, and of course everybody said yes because that boss fight slaps and the music is amazing, but whether you'll forgive me or not, we're now at the nether brain. I used invisibility to skip past all the fights leading up to the brain, and I now have five turns to kill this thing, or I lose. Verana is the hero of this story because she will be the one to destroy the nether brain. First, I used haste on Verana, and this is where I forgot the entire reason I recruited Minthara was to use soul branding so I would have extra movement speed, but whatever, I forgot, and you can't go back in other mode, so it's done. I used a scroll of dimension door to get Verana down to the bottom without using any of her own resources, and I grouped everybody else under a globe of invulnerability. Not necessary, but that's what I did. With Verana, I used dash three times and then used click heals from my boots of speed to double my movement speed, and it put me at exactly 1,000 feet of movement for this turn. Then I used action surge and used my last action point to equip my boots of stormy clamor. As you know by now, these boots add two stacks of reverberation whenever I inflict a condition on an enemy. My ballist armor has has an aura called the Aura of Murder. This is a condition that makes enemies vulnerable to physical damage, but it doesn't matter what it does, all that matters is that it is a condition. Now, of course, I tried just toggling this on and off, but that didn't work. Reverberation only got applied on the first time. I also tried walking out of range and then back into range, but that didn't work either. What did work, though, is walking out of range using some other ability and then walking back into range. For some reason, Reason, using another ability seems to just reset something in the game's code and it lets me apply reverberation again, so I just needed an ability that I could use that doesn't cost an action point. Time to say hello to the monk inside my sentient amulet, or at least try to say hello, but it turns out that I cannot use that right now. By walking away from the brain, clicking on the talk to the sentient amulet ability, and walking back towards the brain, I can continue applying reverberation stacks for as long as I have movement speed to move back and forth. My movement speed build is pretty good. It could have been a lot better, but it's more than enough. Not only do I have a way to convert movement speed into damage, but I have enough movement speed to kill the nether brain in just one turn. But that's not very sporting. Come on, let's give the little fellow a chance, right? This is honor mode, so the next turn the brain became immediately immune to thunder damage for the whole round. So I used my action point to equip Orin's dagger, which conveniently grants one use of the cantrip, True Strike. And the next round, I went ahead and used True Strike to finish off the brain and complete my honor mode run. 
I cast True Strike well over 2,000 times this run, and I didn't use any other offensive abilities. It's official. True Strike is the best cantrip in the game. Confirmed. Don't care what you say. I'm not taking it back. 